Without further ado, I would like to invite our opening keynote speaker for today, Tony McLaughlin, Managing Director of Transaction Banking at Citigroup. Tony is responsible for emerging payments and business development in Citi's Treasury and Trade Solutions, uh, TTS. Uh, for uh, and and Tony works for the for also the future of money strategy and is responsible for TTS e-commerce proposition. Is deeply involved in new methods of payment such as distributed ledger, fintech engagements, and he is one of the leading experts on the future of payments, providing advice regularly actually to governments, regulators, fintechs, big techs, and banks all over the world. Tony, I would love to hand over it uh, to you today uh, to start your presentation, which I believe is titled The Regulated Internet of Value, Reframing the Future of Digital Money. Take it away, Tony. It's a pleasure to talk to you today about a topic which is close to every banker's heart, which is the future of money. And uh, today what I'd like to do is to give a framework for thinking about where we are on that journey uh, draw some fairly simple conclusions about where we might be headed and maybe at the end come up with some surprising uh, ideas about how we might pivot the existing efforts in banks and at central banks to move forward as a regulated industry. But to begin with, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that uh, the future of money is a very noisy environment. There's lots of news about uh, cryptocurrency, its highs and its lows. Um, you know, one minute Bitcoin is over $60,000, the next minute it's crashed. Um, you know, social media companies thinking about developing their own currencies as if they are countries. Many central banks developing concepts on central bank digital currency. So what is going on? How are we to make sense of this constant news flow? And I would suggest to you that each of us, uh, we can place ourselves on the following map. You know, not, dimension number one is how into crypto, for example, are we? Have we read the Bitcoin white paper or are we just watching the news flow pass by and trying to understand from a distance? So, Dimension number one is familiarity with this topic. Do we know de what DeFi means and all of its intricacies? Or are we lay people? Many of us are more towards the lay side of the spectrum and wondering what's going on in the depths of the crypto ecosystem. And the second dimension is even if we're knowledgeable about the crypto space, do, what do we believe is going on? Some people believe that this is a new tulip mania and others believe that something fundamental is going on in the restructuring not only of money but in financial markets and even broader into the economic activity taking place on digital platforms. So all of us are somewhere on this map and the, the fact is that people are all over the map and in financial services we're all over the map in terms of our familiarity with the topic and our opinions about what it means. So in this presentation, what I would like to do is present a very simple framework based upon money. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that we're coming to the end of the contest between physical and digital money. And digital money appears to be winning. The era that we're entering into is the contest between different forms of digital money. So the kind of money that we have today, the kind of what when you think about how much money have I got, that's one particular form of digital money. That may not be the form that wins out in the end. So let's take a moment to explore the different um, runners and riders in this race. So here is a breakdown of the different types of digital money, each with very special characteristics. And beginning with the root of the system, the root of the national currency system is central bank money. 
Central bank money is available to you and I through notes and coins, but at this present time, we do not have access to electronic central bank money. That's the sole preserve of financial institutions. Um, banks have accounts at the central banks and they use those accounts to conduct operations, for example, through the RTGS system, the real-time growth settlement system like CHAPS in the UK or Fedwire in the US. So central bank money has special attributes. Um, settlements over central bank money have a property called finality of settlement, which means that they cannot be unwound through bankruptcy proceedings. And clearly, central bank money is a liability of the nation state. So backed by the full faith and credit of a nation state. So that is... Um, number one in terms of uh, the, the root of the current financial system, the root of national currencies. And it may be about to become through CBDC available in digital format to all economic actors. The second type of digital money happens to be the predominant type of digital money at this point in time. It's called commercial bank money. It's a liability of a commercial bank. Obviously, therefore, it has counterparty risk um, against the commercial bank. And again, it's what we usually think about when we think, how much money have I got? We think about our bank balance. But do we think that that bank balance is a liability of a commercial bank? And the other side of that balance sheet are the assets of that commercial bank. So. Commercial bank money happens to be the dominant form of digital money at the moment, but let's see if that continues into the future. The other distinct form of digital money is electronic money, E or e-money. And this is um, a special type of money offered by regulated non-banks. So think about the wallet providers, the large wallet providers in India and in the US and in China. These are all flavors of e-money offered by regulated non-banks. Again, a very special type of money. Genuine, generally, generally, it does not pay interest. It has to be essentially 100% backed by uh, cash held by the e-money operator. Again, it's denominated in national currency. So e-money has become very popular over the past 10 to 15 years. Hundreds of millions of people around the world are using e-money accounts offered by fintechs. So these three types of money that we've just discussed, central bank money, commercial bank money, and e-money, they represent, at the moment, the official sector, and they have some things in common. They're all liabilities. They're all offered by regulated institutions, and notably, at the moment, they're only offered in account-based format. They're not offered in token-based format. And what is this thing about tokens? Well, let's go on to the public cryptocurrencies as the other contender in this race. Public cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. What is their nature? What, what are they as a form of money? And the most striking thing about the likes of Bitcoin is... It is not a liability. It is not on anyone's balance sheet. It's not offered by a central issuer or a regulated institution. In fact, it's an intangible asset, an intangible asset under IAS 38. And that's um, a, as a result of it being a relatively volatile instrument as we've recently seen and through the history of these public cryptocurrencies. So, when you read the Bitcoin white paper, which I, I hope all of you either have or will do, it envisages a world without central banks or financial intermediaries. And that's why it's not a liability of any given institution. So that's public cryptocurrencies. Then we have stable coins. Um, you know, we heard about social media companies uh, launching stable coins. Some of them have grown dramatically and uh, some of them have a slightly controversial uh, history, but nevertheless, there are people who believe that low volatility cryptocurrencies um, will become a method of payment. 
And very notably, the public cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and the stable coins, these are token representations. So what I would suggest to you is that we may be on the verge of another format war. And I don't have to remind you too much about previous format wars, what happened to Kodak, what happened to Blockbuster, what happened to Research in Motion. All of them were involved in very bruising format wars and format wars can be winners, winner takes all battles. We're seeing at the moment in digital music, the battle between physical ways of storing and, and playing digital music versus streaming services. It's clear that the digital native option is winning out. Now, what about money? In money, the digital money format war will be fought along the following lines. In the future, will money be regulated like commercial bank money, central bank money and e-money? Or will it be quasi-regulated like Bitcoin and stable coins? That's question number one. Question number two will be, will the money in the future be a liability? Again, commercial bank money, central bank money, e-money, they are liabilities of regulated institutions. Bitcoin is an anti-liability. It's certainly not a liability. And stable coins, well, that remains to be seen. It's not entirely clear that if you hold a stable coin token, you have a contractual claim on the issuer of that token. So this is of great import to anyone in financial services and beyond which is the digital money format war, the battle between regulated money and non-regulated money, between liabilities and quasi-liabilities, and between tokens versus accounts. And my final point is this, which is, what's so special about tokens? Well, we let's start with the familiar, which is accounts. Accounts are records of liabilities. They're an artifact of double entry bookkeeping, and they're about you, they're about your balance with a bank and that bank holding a record of its liability towards you. That's the world of accounts. The world of tokens we can now understand because it formed around non-liabilities. It's not about double entry bookkeeping and it's not really about you. It's about the token itself, which if you have the private key, essentially you own the asset and you control the asset. So. Here's where we get to the crunch point, which is there's this thing that we might call the tokenization thesis. And the tokenization thesis is the idea that building the financial systems on tokens is superior to building it on traditional account-based infrastructure. And why might that be so? What are the perceived or purported advantages of tokens? Well, number one, token infrastructures are always on. And the traditional financial system clearly is not. Um, you know, RTGS systems are not always on. ACH systems are not always on. Instant payment systems are always on, but that's the exception to prove the rule. Bond markets, equity markets, FX markets, money markets, these markets are not running 24 by 7, but the DLT does. So that's one advantage over the traditional financial system. Second is programmability through smart contracts. Thank to, thanks to the wonderful um, contributions of Vitalik Buterin, we have the concept of, of smart contracts. And so potentially a world of tokens is more programmable than a world of traditional siloed uh, financial infrastructure. We're at the very early stages of open banking with banks providing APIs. And with those APIs, which are very limited in scope at the moment, you can't really say that the financial system is programmable. So maybe a tokenized alternative would be better. And then finally, you get to what to me is probably the most powerful argument for tokenization, which is that tokens are inherently multi-asset. Tokenization just means representation. And representation means you can, can, you can use any technology for representation. I can represent financial instruments through Lego blocks or on an Excel spreadsheet. But the, the nature of tokens, the fact that these tokens are chains of digital signatures, which create this immutable ledger, means that they're better than Lego blocks, better than Excel spreadsheets at 
tokenizing or representing financial assets. So what's truly interesting, I think, is a test of the tokenization thesis, which is, is a system based upon tokens a leap forward from the kinds of financial infrastructures that the regulated sector has at the moment? Now, based on this analysis, what changes to the current approaches might we recommend? Well, number one is this. The regulated money, meaning central bank money, commercial bank money and e-money, at the moment is only available through accounts. So it would seem obvious that we should investigate the potential of moving regulated money to tokens to see whether that would bring the benefits of always on operation and programmability. And what that means is that perhaps we could pivot all of the CBDC projects. CBDC, central bank digital currency, is narrowly focused on central bank liabilities. Perhaps that can be extended to encompass all regulated liabilities. And that may be a worthwhile pivot for the financial sector to investigate. Let's not have a narrow focus on central bank liabilities. Let's have a broad focus on regulated liabilities. And let's bring stable coins into the fold as regulated liabilities, which means a good regulatory framework and also their liabilities, clear liabilities of the issuer, which means they promise to pay the better on demand in national currency units. And finally, let's explore the multi-asset nature of tokens. So let's not just put money onto regulated blockchains. Let's put all regulated assets onto regulated blockchains. And the great thing about that is we could really build what we call the regulated internet of value. Because it's not just a digital money format war that we're facing. There's a broader contest out there between regulated and unregulated financial services. And if the killer app in that battle is tokenization, then the regulated sector needs to embrace that tokenization in a coherent way. So that's my uh, discussion on the future of money. Um, I think we should take the tokenization thesis seriously. We should test the tokenization thesis and uh, I welcome future dialogue on this topic. Thank you very much.